Certainly one of the one of the goals of, of this line of inquiry is really about right, shaping how we talk about college student health and that that conversation is inclusive, but that conversation also needs to be nuanced and culturally responsive. Welcome to EdFix. I'm Michael Foyer, your host on this podcast, a source of insights about the practice and promise of education. We're delighted today that Professor Delisha Pittman has come by Studio T here. Delisha is an assistant professor of counseling in our Graduate School of Education and Human Development and does really fascinating research with emphasis on racial and ethnic disparities in health behaviors and in health outcomes. First of all, good morning. And say a little bit about your own background. I want to start with that this time. Yeah, absolutely. This is my fifth year here at GW. It's gone by very quickly, but it's been um, a really fantastic community to be a part of. Um, prior to joining the faculty here at GW, I was at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon for two years. I did my graduate work at the University of Georgia. So my PhD is actually in counseling psychology, so I'm a psychologist by training uh, and train master's level therapists here at GW, and all of the other degrees are also in psychology. Originally from Arizona, born and raised, second generation Phoenician, so I've been a little bit of everywhere. What point did you actually recognize your own interest in issues related to psychology, and then how did things develop into this rather more specific connection of health, psychology, and now, of course, counseling? Sure. The, the work that I do now, particularly in terms of my research agenda, is actually deeply personal, and it didn't begin that way. I think I, I found psychology in college. Growing up, I thought I wanted to be a pediatrician, and I think growing up in poverty, there weren't a whole lot of professions that I had exposure to. And so I decided I wanted to be a pediatrician because I actually really liked my own pediatrician. And it seemed like a really cool job to have, although I had zero understanding of what it took to become a pediatrician. And so getting to college really sort of became fascinated by human behavior, particularly in a team context. I have played sports most of my life, um, played basketball in college and had some teammates who really struggled with a host of behavioral health issues. But also even in high school, I think thinking retrospectively, sort of straddling two lines, being a student who had been tracked really early on and was in an IB program in a very urban public school system. And so, you know, had a very sort of small social network as an IB student in high school that was very high achieving, um, not particularly diverse, but also being a three season athlete and having most of my peers in sports be mainstream students. And so I sort of straddled two lines, if you will, and having both sort of mainstream and IB social networks and recognizing how different our lives and our opportunities were because of sort of where we were in the social milieu of our high school. And so I think this was even a high school in Phoenix. In Phoenix. Yes. A big high school. Your big basic school, all purpose American high school yeah. with uh, about how many how My many? graduating class had almost a thousand students. Yeah. Um, so we were we were a large high school in central Phoenix. And it was you know, it was interesting that I, I started at North High as a freshman and then in my sophomore year we moved out of district and so uh, I made the decision to stay at my high school, and so it was a two-hour bus ride each way. Um, so I'd get up at 4 a.m. to get on the bus by 5.30 to make it to my zero-hour class, as we <laughs> had it at the time. And then I would, you know, do my IB curriculum as, you know, any high schooler would, and then I'd go to practice or a game. Um, I played volleyball, basketball, and I ran track in high school. And so I'd, you know, I'd have these really, really long days. But I, again, I recognized really early on um, that we were having really disparate experiences, even in the classroom. You know, my friends who I ran track with or played basketball with, most of them were mainstream. Most of my volleyball peers were IB. And so it also really sort of introduced me to sort of the social social class dynamics of athletics, particularly in public education systems. And so I think 
my life has sort of been priming me for the work that I do now in a way that I, I hadn't sort of pieced together in any intentional way prior to getting to college. And in college, I you know switched my major from pre-med to psychology and it was sort of the rest is history, as they say. And then I got a master's degree in um, community mental health counseling. And my focus there was in addiction treatment, which if you would have told me that as a kid, I would have said absolutely never, not ever. Both of my parents are addicts in recovery. And so growing up with addicted parents, choosing to study addiction as my life's work was would not have been a choice I would have made. <laughs> so when people ask me, I sort of say that it was divine intervention. It was sort of a, I guess, a path I was supposed to walk before I knew I would walk it. And so that has sort of led me I guess, if you will, to focusing on emerging adults, particularly between the ages of 18 and 29. Um, I study them in a college context. Let me interrupt with just a rewind question here. When you say that most of the students at the high school were mainstream, uh, unpack that word for us. What what do you mean by mainstream? Is that with respect to the IB program versus the, the regular high school curriculum, or are you talking also about the racial and demographic mix in the school? No, racially, racially, our school was quite diverse. And we were a majority minority institution, high school at the time, particularly having really large uh, Latino population, but mainstream in reference to IB. So IB is, you know, a very small program. It's like a cohort program, if you will. You start with the same folks, you essentially graduate with the same people. And so we get to know one another really well, which is unlike our mainstream high school curriculum. When you were a wee child and you thought about pediatrics, what was it about that pediatrician who that became a role model? Yeah, Um, I'll never forget. Dr. Richard Gere was my pediatrician. He then went on to a small career in in yes, yes, in film. Uh, No, Ah. different Richard Gere, but he was this tall, gregarious. African American man, and he seemed just larger than life as a child. And I haven't seen him in years. And so I'm six one, so I don't know how I would feel in relation to him now. Maybe he's maybe I'm taller than him. I actually don't know. But at the time, he just, you know, he was approachable. And I recall every a- appointment that we would have, he would let me play with his stethoscope. And I thought it was the coolest thing to be able to listen to his heartbeat with his stethoscope. It, like it was just like magic. And so, you know, I just had really positive memories of going to the doctor as a child. Mm -hmm. And so to your question, I think it's absolutely crucial that, that young people have exposure, not just in their classroom, but in their social networks, in their communities um, of people who are doing interesting, diverse career trajectories, particularly given the the conditions and the spaces that I grew up, growing up in the projects in Arizona, but going to predominantly white schools most of my life, there was always a real um, tension between who I went to school with and who I played with when I got home and, you know, who our uh, friends were and what their parents did. Um, Most of my neighbors were single parents like my mom. So my brother and I have been latchkey for a very, very long time, longer than is probably even legal. (laughs) Now you can't leave a four and five year old at home by themselves these days. Uh, Probably shouldn't have done it then either. But and so, you know, the circumstances, I think, were really different. And so we just weren't exposed to, I think, even a whole lot of individuals who had careers. We had I knew lots of people who had jobs, but I don't know that I knew a lot of individuals who had careers. And I didn't have an African-American teacher until I was in the fifth grade. And then I wouldn't have another until I was in graduate school at Georgia. Um, And so, you know, even seeing myself reflected in even the schools that I was going to, seeing people who looked like me doing things that required a degree really wasn't um, the norm. Let's uh, talk for a minute about um, what you said earlier that you were doing addiction counseling and training addiction counselors. This is, of course, a huge issue in the United States today. What's your sense of the status and how, how is the counseling community reacting to this and participating in this? You know, one of the things that I I really loved about my 
position um, at my previous institution at Lewis and Clark is that the the counseling department actually has a specialty in, in addiction counseling, which I think was a much more intentional preparation of counselors for work um, in addiction treatment, which is is, tre- is of tremendous need. But I, I really think it's hard to be a therapist in this day and age and not have some understanding of addiction. Um, it's very, very prevalent. You know, I think some stats are as high as one in two individuals know someone, a loved one, a close family friend whose life has been impacted by addiction. So it's really difficult to be a therapist and not experience it in some way, even peripherally. I think it's as pervasive as trauma. I think we're starting to understand that sort of trauma is kind of a universal experience. It's really sort of understanding how people respond to trauma that really makes the difference in terms of what we do. I think. I'm what one of the things that I am really grateful for, if grateful is the right word, <laughs> is the how pervasive the opioid crisis has has become, um, because I think it's really allowing us to shed light on addictive behavior more broadly. Um, but I think you know, as with our healthcare system, we don't tend to pay attention to things that are building in that direction. We we're much more reactive, and so we sort of have f- found ourselves at this point of really needing to to respond to something that's been happening in our country for a very, very long time. And the drugs are just changing and who they're impacting is changing. Um, And so we care more now than we have in the past. But if you sort of look back in the 80s and 90s, cocaine and crack have had very similar impacts on very different communities. And so there just haven't been the resources to address them preventatively or to provide effective treatment in ways that we see now, which is great uh, that it's happening. This was much more pervasive in, in among people of color. Is that absolutely, but with pretty similar detrimental effects. Um, I think the the difference is that most folks are getting opiates, you know, from. I, well, not, I wouldn't say most, but there's a large group of folks who have a valid reason for having opiate medications, become addicted to them, and then it sort of spirals. But again, before opiates hit the middle class, particularly the white middle class. Opiate abuse was not new. It was not new to us, particularly those of us who are working in addiction treatment. And so it was very much hitting poor communities, you know, with pretty significant consequences and criminalization behind it. And so, you know, the response to someone having an overdose or someone being found in possession, if you're poor, is much different than, you know, a college student who's overdosing on opiate medications on their college campus. Why? Should they be treated differently? Maybe. But I think it's, you know, I think the conversation is worth having around whether or not those behaviors should be criminalized differently. And so, you know, even the sort of the trajectories of of substance use are quite different for communities of color than they are for white communities. And so I think it's really under, it's important to understand the nuance and the difference in those communities, because I think that should be driving intervention efforts. There isn't kind of a one size fits all treatment approach, which is generally what you get in addiction treatment. You get intensive, you get inpatient, you get outpatient, you get some level of intensive outpatient or, you know, treatment in lieu of jail time, but it it pretty much is a one size fits all approach. And if you can't afford inpatient, then you get intensive outpatient, and those programs are nominally effective at best. Yeah. Well, okay, so from addiction, let's go now into some of your current work. I've read pieces of this, and I'm eager to hear you unpack some of what you've been finding when it comes to racial and ethnic disparities Mm -hmm. in health behaviors uh, so my, as I mentioned earlier, my work is really focused on emerging adult populations. So I study college students in particular, and I study college students, particularly black college students or African-American college students, as a really quick growing faction of college student demographics. But the majority of black college students are also first generation. So I'm really interested in sort of the intersections of multiple minority status and how that impacts. Um, first generation meaning not that they're first generation American, they're first generation college students. College students, mm-hmm. okay. Um, so understanding sort of how um, how those processes translate and impact, you know, a host of health behavior and academic outcomes. My earlier work really focused on coping motivated alcohol use behavior in college students. So looking at how college students were using alcohol to help manage stress, life stress, acculturative stress, race related stress, and in that work 
the path has unfolded to understanding sexual health behavior more recently. And the work that I'm currently doing was sort of forged out of two paths. One was a, a series of conversations I was having with peers of mine, girlfriends, all of whom are college educated. Many of us are academics and researchers in some capacity um, who study minority health, a host of minority health issues. And one of the conversations that we were having was about our own health and about women's health in particular, um, and the failing of health disparities research to really have a vested interest in black women's health. Um, there's a real bias in the literature on black women's health that we don't actually study black women until they're sick um, in ways that we actually understand and study how we keep communities healthy. Um, we don't actually study black women until they're very, very sick. Um, and so there's sort of a pathology or orientation to understanding black women's health. And that conversation led us to like, well, nobody in college, nobody was actually asking us about what we were doing. It didn't, nobody actually cared um, about what we were doing specifically. And then moving here to DC, as wonderful as this city is, it's also plagued with some pretty significant health disparities, racial ethnic health disparities. And one of those health disparities um, has been around the HIV risk and infection behavior. And so that work, um, understanding the HIV work, has been about understanding HIV in the context of the, the age range that I study, 18 to 29-year-olds. But if you look at sort of one of the largest groups of those impacted by HIV infection, it is 18 to 25-year-olds and Black women, particularly heterosexual Black women. But the other side of that is that heterosexual Black women are really not, uh, between the ages of 18 and 25, particularly in college, are not included in many of the epidemiological data sets. So we don't actually know what their risk behaviors are. We don't know what their risk profile is. We don't know what the prevalence of HIV infection in the population is because we don't study them, which is sort of where my work is focused now and sort of understanding both the risk and protective factors for HIV infection in heterosexual black college women. The data sets that exist, these are these are mostly public public data sets, National Institutes of Health or CDC. Tr CDC. Yeah. And they do some amount of disaggregation of the data by different kinds of demographic attributes or not? They do. One of the challenges with the data sets and, and, and HIV research in general, particularly as it relates to black women, is we, we keep looking for the same needle in the same haystack and we keep finding it, right? So if I'm looking for HIV infection in black women who are in poverty, who have less than a high school diploma, and who are exchanging sex for drugs and money, I'm going to find it there. I know it's there. So if I keep funding research to look for it there, I will keep finding it there. But what we also have to recognize is that's a very small fraction of the Black female population. You know, that represents a very specific group of women with a very specific set of risk factors. And, and most Black women don't exist there. And so by, by default, uh, many of these data sets that are looking at HIV infection risk behavior often have inclusion or exclusion criteria that you have less than a high school diploma, which de facto excludes anyone who's currently in college, at, either at a two-year or four-year institution. Or if an inclusion criterion is that you've exchanged sex for drugs and money in the past 12 months, likely also going to exclude anyone in college. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not engaging in similar risky sexual behavior, but we don't understand it and we don't study it. And so I think that has been the issue with these data sets is that their inclusion and exclusion criteria essentially leave out these women. And so even in all of the rich data that they do collect, we can't actually understand sexual health behavior among black college students in any real in-depth way. I mean, you have found data somehow to get back into this sort of zone of, of interest, which is black women in college yes. with respect to health and risk behaviors. I have not found the data. I've created the data. <laughs> so um, it's all primary. The data. Yes. You didn't create the well, data. I collected the data, right? <laughs> so I, it's all primary data collection. And uh, last spring, I conducted a pilot study, a qualitative pilot study with 18 black college women enrolled in colleges and universities in the Baltimore, Washington metropolitan area. And those interviews were really enlightening um, in terms of sort of understanding what black women are doing 
you know, their partner preferences, where they're dating, who they're dating, why they're dating, and their experiences in dating. Um, and so those conversations were really broad and has helped really helped sort of inform some quantitative work that I'm currently doing to refine a recruitment strategy, a mobile recruitment strategy to engage black women in sexual health behavior. I think one of the things that's been really interesting and coming out of the work is the differences between that black women at predominantly white institutions are having versus their counterparts at historically black colleges and universities. For example, the young women who we interviewed, there's a much higher experience of racism and exoticism or fetishism in their dating experience, particularly when they attempt to date outside of their race compared to their counterparts at HBCUs. Their university cultures are quite different around sexual health. And, you know, even when you look at the universities here in the district, you know, at Georgetown as a Jesuit institution, you cannot have condoms on campus, whereas if you go to Howard, they are everywhere and they are public and accessible and in, your and students are encouraged to access them. Here at GW, you can get them. They're not necessarily as available, widely available. And so every institution has a really different culture around um, sexual health practice, which I think also shapes the conversation differently. The other thing that I'm really interested in understanding is the role that online dating plays in the dating practices of college women um, and subsequently how that relates to their risk behavior. You know, in the conversations that my friends and I were having, you know, you just dated whoever was on your adjoining sports team or whoever was in the dorm next to you. But now you can, you know, swipe right or left on anyone within a hundred mile radius of you, which in a city like DC with really high rates of STI and HIV infection, and you have a high disease burden in your dating pool, your risk is exponentially higher when you sort of go outside the, you know, the university walls. And so one of the things that I say, particularly about the work that I'm doing now, is that college is not a condom. And so we really need to be having conversations about what students are doing. And NIH has varying degrees of interests in this work. The DCC for the Center for AIDS Research is really interested in the work and recognizes that this is a population that we don't really understand. And so really trying to figure out how do we how do we understand this population? How do we characterize their risk behavior or characterize what they're doing to keep them keep them safe? I think you're you're doing some pretty cutting edge kind of stuff here. Because you're dealing with this population that is, for all kinds of reasons, underrepresented in the national data sets, which have been focusing on the more, shall we say, pathological uh, you know, cases and the communities that are the greatest most obviously at risk. So right there, you're doing something which is pushing the, the frontier here. This January, I published a conceptual paper, sort of a theoretical paper about why I think black college women should be considered a high-risk population for HIV infection. Mm -hmm. And in that paper, I identify sort of five risk factors, three of which I term shared risk factors, which are risk factors that black college women are engaging in that all college students engage in. Things like partner concurrency or multiple partner concurrency, which is having multiple partners at the same time, inconsistent condom use, and risky drinking behavior as sort of shared college student risk factors. And then I also identified what I call unique risk factors for the population, which I think are unique to Black college women, and those are high STI burden. So when you look at rates of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis within Black women, their rates are anywhere from five to nine times higher than their white counterparts. And if you have a history of STI, STI, it increases your risk for HIV two to five fold. And so really sort of understanding using STI infection as a proxy for HIV infection, if you will. Uh, and then the other unique risk factor are segregated dating practices. Black women are far more likely to date within their own race than other racial ethnic groups, I guess, or stated differently, far less likely to date outside of their race than other racial ethnic groups. Um, and so given that black men occupy a, a pretty large portion of those infected with HIV every year, if you're only dating within that pool, your risk of infection is increased exponentially theoretically. Certainly one of the one of the goals of, of this line of inquiry is really about shaping the discourse, right? Shaping how we talk about college student health and that that conversation is inclusive, but that conversation also needs to be nuanced and culturally responsive. Your, your home base is the counseling department. It is, yes. And so we are preparing future uh, clinicians, essentially, for work in this 
general area and then more specifically that connect to your research? Do I have that right? Yes, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I really love about studying college students um, is in, in studying 18 to 25 year olds more broadly is that many of our students sort of fall in that demographic. I think like graduate schools across the country, seeing a, a lessening or a lowering of our average student age as students come right out of undergrad into graduate school. So we get quite a few students who are really in that 20 to 25 year old age bracket. And so studying their experience and understanding them as, as a college student and many of them continue in those behaviors because that is college is where we really start to develop a lot of the behaviors we carry into adulthood. You know, it's been really helpful to understand that and to sort of help students pay attention to those things in a counseling context, but also being able to bring my research into the room to help students get comfortable having conversations about things like someone's sexual behavior. You know, how do you tactfully ask about someone's sexual experience. Certainly we get students who utilize services in our clinic following a diagnosis. They've gotten an STI from a partner and they're having to live with that even if it is very treatable. And sometimes they're not curable, right? There are a host of of STI, sexually transmitted infections that aren't curable that people can live with, but they certainly seek counseling services to manage the Uh, the psychological distress that they create. And so, you know, it's a way for me to sort of bring back into the classroom some of the things that's happening in a way that that many of our students may not be aware of, but also helping them understand what our role as counselors might look like for those students or those folks who participate in my research who might show up in our office for a different issue. Wow. This has been absolutely riveting for me. We are so grateful for the work you are doing and for um, the contribution you're making to the, just not, not just the knowledge base on this, but to the actual sense of hope that we might have to take some of these difficult situations, use the research evidence and the data, and come up with some things that make the world a little bit of a better place. I can't ask for much more than that. but It's I think, a life well lived if I can uh, accomplish that. There you go. Be happy with that. It's been wonderful to have Delisha Pittman with us today on uh, EdFix. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to the EdFix podcast on iTunes or Spotify, iHeartRadio, Player FM, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. EdFix is produced by the inimitable executive director, producer, editor, and chief, Turan Waters. For more information about our podcast and our guests and our other episodes, we have an EdFix website called edfixpodcast.com. Again, Delisha, thank you so very much for spending time with us. Absolutely wonderful.